Um, and so, um, without further ado, um, Gerald Hines, an incomparable leader in local design in Houston and design all over the world. Please join me in welcoming them both. Thank you. Good morning. When I heard that Scenic America was hosting their national conference in Houston, I was excited and honored, as I have been a strong believer and supporter since the start of my real estate firm in 1957, that better aesthetics lead to better cities and better economics. I have been a supporter of Scenic Houston since the beginning. I can't believe that it's been almost 60 years. Wow, the time has flown. And now, 85% of our billboards are gone, and lush landscaping is part of our highway system. And with Houston as a city tagged without zoning, we get a lot of mud slapped at us. <laughs> and so scenic Houston is especially important in Houston. As I travel the country, people ask about that. How do you have a city that's as good as it is? Well, scenic Houston is one of the reasons and the people that support it. We've all grown and achieved notable success in this past several decades. We've been able to grow the Heinz firm from a one man, two, one secretary and one man, <laughs> to grow the Heinz firm to a global concern with 3,500 employees working in 100 cities on five continents. I began building as a I'm a mechanical engineer by education, and I came here in 1948 and with a company from Detroit in which we were doing engineering and mechanical engineering of buildings. I began building small office and warehouse projects in addition to my engineering job. Then when I had enough cash flow from my properties, where I could support my family, I, I left the engineering company and went full-time in 1957 as a developer. Then I was fortunate to work on a series of buildings along Richmond Avenue. It was there that I discovered the lasting value of design, coupled, of course, with good functionality and cost including an early eye toward conservation of energy and natural resources. That's one of the things that we wanted to do as an engineer. I wanted to build the most efficient buildings. And today we are building the most efficient buildings. We will have a building in San Diego, the first zero energy building. We're also building <coughs> a 64 story building in San Francisco in which the compressors will only run 25 hours for the whole year because we have direct access to fresh air on every floor, the first building to do this. And this will be a major breakthrough in, in energy. Of course, in San Diego and S San Francisco are pretty good places to do it. Pretty tough to do it in Chicago and Washington, D.C., but uh, we're working on those. The <clears throat> we discovered on Richmond Avenue, we built, finally built a five-story building with Harwood Taylor and Vic Newhouse that was very, very well received. I found that by building really great looking buildings at a reasonable cost that we could attract good tenancy and my leasing was faster and 
sometimes got a little, a, a five cent bonus. So, but, so how do you develop major buildings with, at a reasonable cost that can be architectural gems in that community? Well, we developed a group of engineers and architects that we call our conceptual construction group. And they are composed of 15 people. So we have a specialist in mechanical systems and we actually do the research. The research was done for that project in San Francisco in our office. And so we broke through and then we have people on electrical doing systems. We're coming up with a, some interesting ideas on a project we're doing in Shanghai. We have a 52-story building there that we're building, and the way you make your reputation in Shanghai is at night. And there are some horrible examples in the other across the river in Shanghai. So our group came up, I said, we've got to come up with a lighting system that's quality and is and you have to shut the, your lights off at 11 o'clock in Shanghai. So we've come up with some interesting designs that will add to our architecture. And this is in the Bund, which is across from where it has been developed. And this is the old place where the Germans, the French, the British, and the Americans grabbed pieces of China and had their own so the Chinese kicked them out, but that's where we're building our first building, a big building there. So lighting at night is also a very important aspect in how a city looks. And uh, Shanghai is probably one of the most lit building, lit cities at night. So that's a whole new area we're looking at and trying to explore and solve. From this row of small buildings, I went on to do larger. My first major tower was a 50-story, one-shell plaza in downtown Houston, working with Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. We created the tallest lightweight concrete structure in the world, and that's still the tallest. But it was, at the time, the tallest concrete building. But the building is still a standout in terms of ageless design, clad in white limestone, and generous and elegant public spaces. It's a sculptural look that, that really created one shell at the base. If you look at it and drive by it, you'll see those deep voids on the ground floor. That's what makes it, and then the second floor, that high second floor. It made a reputation for us and helped get us our next building, which was Pennzoil, and because of a partner in Baker Botts was also the president of Pennzoil. And I got Philip Johnson. First I had a competition between Skidmore, Bruce Graham, and Philip Johnson. Well, Philip Johnson came up with the two buildings. I needed a second tenant and I got one with that second. And no one had put two buildings on a block in Houston. And we won the Building of the Year Award from Ada Louise Huxtable. And that was a start of our getting national attention. Um, we've been developing uh, since the 60s and it started in 57. And we're now in important cities like New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Atlanta, Boston, and Seattle. Each time we develop a single building, we are very conscious of the context within the city. It's also worked diligently, and it, w it was a sighted correctly, that it had visually appealing outdoor and indoor spaces, and it was an asset to both the skyline and its community. And we also use sculpture, which we think is, if you can get a really significant piece of sculpture, and it becomes part of the city, we're working on that right now in Calgary. We got a major competition for a piece of sculpture there on the building. Buildings and office and residential is a sustainable 
that is sustainable and tests, tests the time and stands the test of time and stays relevant and beautiful is a great goal which I hope we've achieved time and time again. I would love to show you 40 years of work, but we would be here all day. Instead, I chose just five projects to show you that I selected, which are mixed use in different cities throughout the world at, that I thought would be, you'd be interested in. A focus on quality density is definitely in fashion today due to the explosive urban growth. It's nothing new to our firm, but in, back in the early 70s, when a Texas developer with scant experience was developing the tallest building in Texas at the time, I was also undertaking another project would change Houston and the trajectory of my future, and that was the Galleria. To do both those projects at the same time, you had to be some kind of a nut, and I was. <laughs> now, if, <clears throat> if either the Galleria or One Shell Plaza would not have been a success, then I wouldn't be here today. Luckily, both developments succeeded, and we jumped off from that pivot point to better architect, to doing more work with some interesting projects. When I thought I would show you five, <coughs> five projects in, <coughs> in different cities, which were all multi-use and different types of architecture and parks and landscaping. I hope to show you that a commitment to great master planning, great design, proper mix of green space and the inclusion of public art and terrific landscaping and a design welcoming to the important surrounding community can be a spark of great ripple have a great ripple effect. When we talk about creating a catalyst, I will show you what we did in Houston, then what we did in uptown Houston. The tax increment zone that was created to shore up the infrastructure in the city, within a city, that grew up around the Galleria. Forty years later, the area is a true mixed-use neighborhood with retail, office, hotel, residential, and has a quality of life if, the, if we can get our traffic right. Uh, we've got some problems, we've got some things to do yet. So please let me indulge you by looking at a few slides. Afterwards, we will hear from Della Mizwa of Uptown Houston, and then we will chat, sit down for a chat. And then we'll ask them some questions, okay. We, we'll start with showing you some slides. The Galleria, I went to, um, we developed joskies across the street, and that's how I got involved in that piece of ground when a, a, the owner wanted a bank. And so I worked that and then got Neiman Marcus, and then the ULI said, Nobody develops a shopping center with just one major, but we did. And we, we developed it. I wanted to go four stories, but I couldn't. I only had enough money for three. <laughs> and so we left the, the columns in for the foundation, and uh, we figured out what to do. We put in 10 tennis courts on top. But the ice skating rink, creating great indoor spaces that were visually exciting the reason that we did that was that the prime retail center or fashion level got usually $12 a square foot and the basement got $2. I said, well, that's crazy. We gotta do something to figure out how to get more traffic on that basement. So that's how the, the ice rink came about. No one had done an ice rink except in Seattle, they had it just like a store. And I said, why didn't you put it in the middle? They said, oh, the, the uh, operating cost is so much higher, double. I took out my slide room and worked out. It was two cents a square foot. Well, our two, $2 basement space finally leased up at $12. So the two cents got thrown out the window. 
So program elements and can define a space and a project and an area. And the Galleria did that. And so, go ahead. This shows some of the uh, uh, buildings around. Of course, we had lakes and added water and park features. Of course, I wanted to tie up all the land around the gallery because I knew it was going to go be very, very good. But I had a limit. But I did a lot of joint ventures with the hobbies and Bob Smith, and then we developed a park. We had, this is a 64-story building, the Williams Tower, and Transco needed to be in that, and we built that building in, and had occupancy in 16 months. Never been done before, because it was an open site. We didn't, we weren't in a downtown area, and we had occupying a 64-story building by Philip Johnson, and created a park which Defi helps define the area, and we are now opening what we call our water wall apartments that are opposite this. And so this is, then we go to Diego Lamar. This is in Barcelona. And this was a huge project done on the, on the industrial side of Barcelona. Everyone said, oh, it's in a bad part of town, you can't do it. I said, yes, but I'm, I'm a, a hundred meters from the sea. I've never seen one that I couldn't get, if you get to the sea, that's gonna be good. And then we worked with the, the, the county. They had a park that was right behind us. And we said, why don't we turn the park from where it is now and we'll run it right down the middle of our development and run to the sea. <coughs> And they agreed, and we, and we did, and it's become major. It is the address in Barcelona today because of the park and the attention to the sea. And this is some of the, of the it has a water feature, a big park feature, and the apartments have all, except in the last year or two, have sold very well. But that gives you an idea, go ahead. There you can see the park running straight through, and uh, that's what we traded with the county. And to have residential in a park is a fabulous is is a fabulous location. And this is in Paris on the Seine River. We negotiated with where Renault started their automobile company on the Seine River. We worked with them and on some 92 acres and then plus other parts on the other side of the Seine River. And we developed roughly 650,000 square meters, meters. So add another zero to your, uh, of residential, retail, and public facilities. Uh, we still have the island to develop and this is some buildings we built across the river by IM Pei, and, uh, but these are some of the buildings in Renault. And there's a big park, and this is uh, Foster. But this is John Nouvelle. He's a crazy man, <laughs> but he, he, he was a guy who comes in and looks like a truck driver. <laughs> but he, he, he does some interesting things, and he's doing our MoMA Tower in, in New York. President, we'll start construction on that. And <clears throat> this is Porta Nova in Milan. It's kind of interesting as you develop, we have a park, we have a major building, 20 buildings here, and that tower with that mask, when Milan wins a football game, it lights with the colors red, green, and white for the colors of Italy. And uh, so you, 
the project gets definition and uh, Italy is in a pretty tough spot right now from a commercial point of view, but uh, we think we'll, because it is so well done, we've had very good financing and interest from people to be our partners when we needed the money. So, go ahead. It just shows you some of the walkways. This is some 20 buildings, and right now we haven't got all, we don't have all of our condominiums sold. We were selling three, uh, three, two to three a month, and, or four a month, and then it shut down and now we're selling zero because Italy's in a little bit of a tough time right now, but that'll change. But there it shows you the walkways, the plazas, and this is in right in downtown Milan, next to the major station, Garibaldi, which takes you to Paris, Berlin, Frankfurt, and it's right, we're right next to it. There's the, there's the tower that lights up at night at the top, right <coughs> through the hole. And then we go to city center in Washington, D.C., and we're just finishing this project. It's downtown, four blocks from the White House, 10 acres, and it was the old convention center, and it has landscaping, very outstanding landscaping, parks, and open space, which in that part of, it will be the fashion center of Washington, D.C. We've gotten some very good major tenants there. So, and the walk spaces and the, and the, we have condominiums and we have rental apartments. And those, and, and the office buildings have been pretty well leased. And this shows you some of the activities. There's activities in our plazas almost every day. And so downtown Washington is active. Shows you some of the lighting and uh, lighting, I think we've come in. How you light a project at night is very important. I think we're, we're breaking some areas that we haven't discovered yet and how you can animate a, a, a place and make it interesting. And so we'll, when we finish Shanghai, we'll know a lot more. There it shows you the symbol of some of our urban architecture and streetscapes that have become part of the identity of Houston. And uh, we think that's great to let that be symbols. Helps us knock down no zoning. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'll let you take the we'll let you take the mic. Thank you all for having me. This here, um, from others called it a money shot. The symbol, excuse me, a symbol of uptown with the rings and Williams Tower in the background. This was a shot that was taken on Monday Night Football. It was a shot that they came to from a commercial and was taken off of a, obviously off of a TV screen, but this is a symbol of Houston. The rings and the Williams Tower and the standards that Mr. Hines established permeates not only the building industry, but helped establish the standards for the entire uptown market. The influence of a single right decision, the commitment to quality, and the impeccable design is now reflected throughout uptown. Uptown Houston 
is one of the great urban centers that connects business with pleasure, energy with grace, and style with substance. Uptown is a premier mixed-use urban community where residential, retail, office, and entertainment are seamlessly blended. Our commitment to standard established by Mr. Hines, may, has it made a difference? The answer is yes. Our commitment to standard established by, by Mr. Hines is, is one that a person, well, let me step back. A community can actually make a difference. In fact, one person can make a difference. But what is required is that you have to set the standard. You must have a passionate and almost maniacal commitment to those standards and an unrelenting enforcement to those standards. It doesn't take an army, it doesn't take an army or a fortune to remove a bandit sign or to remove stickers from a pole. It takes someone who cares and it makes economic sense. Uptown Houston is one of the most successful mixed-use urban communities in the United States and a leading economic driver for the greater Houston area. We are Houston's hotel district with more than 31 hotels and 7,100 rooms, and a total hotel room revenue in 2012 of over $274 million, more than double than any other area in Houston. Uptown's 5 million square feet of retail, dining, and entertainment generated more than $2.6 billion last year, and the average per capita income within a three-mile radius rivals those of Atlanta's Buckhead, Beverly Center in Beverly Hills, and Highland Park in Dallas. The Uptown office market boasts of almost 24 million square feet of office space and compares in size to cities like Baltimore and Pittsburgh, home to approximately 2,000 companies and more than 80,000 employees. The occupancy rate remains in the 90% range. And recently, two office buildings were added to the area, with two more under construction. But one of the most active markets in the uptown area is the residential market. Since the year 2000, 35 residential projects have been built for a total of over 20,000 units in the uptown area. 7,000 units will come online within the next 24 months. And the values by land use in Uptown is illustrated here. While most of you would believe that retail leads the area, the truth is that office leads with 40%, residential 30%, and surprisingly, retail is 20%, a strong 20%, and hotels at 10%. And the historical values for the area continue to rise. Since overcoming the national financial crisis that began in 2008, the values in Uptown have soared. We have rebounded and exceeded where we, were, where we were before the crisis began. But that's not all. There's so much more to come. 26 projects have recently completed construction or are currently under construction. But how did we get here? The use of special districts like the Uptown Management District and the Uptown Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone are tools that have made the Uptown projects possible. These districts can be very resourceful as they address special, specific community needs and have been successful in stimulating economic growth and development in the area. Uptown's goals have been to address accessibility to and from the area, create an identity and a sense of community, but with a high design standard. And while the needs of the area had and are being addressed, we take it to another level, meeting a standard that was set by Mr. Hines. The completion of the West Loop didn't stop when the concrete cured. 
We greened the West Loop with trees and plants along the freeway frontage. We took a detention pond and created a park. A resident of the Brownstones across the street said to us, thank you so much for what you did. I used to live by the freeway and now I live by a park. Pedestrian improvements included wider sidewalks and pedestrian lighting and landscaping throughout the uptown area. One of the most iconic elements of the area are the stainless steel arches and streetscapes, which include street signage by way of stainless steel rings and internally illuminated street signs, unique bus stops and, and street lights. But the most celebrated and favorite elements of Uptown are the beautiful flowers in the area and Waterwall Park. With all of that, what is in Uptown's future? Uptown is embarking on a project that will raise the standards, creating a grand boulevard, a garden district. All which will include dedicated bus lanes down Post Oak Boulevard, a tree preservation plan that will more than double the number of trees on the boulevard once the project is completed. The, su the success of Uptown is the result of a community, a board of directors who wanted to make a difference and carry on the standards set by Mr. Hines. But what is required is that you have to set those standards. You must have that maniacal commitment to those standards. And you must have an unrelenting enforcement to those standards. And remember, it doesn't take an army or a fortune. It takes someone who cares. Thank you very much. are to have you here today, Mr. Hines. Um, just from a personal standpoint, when I moved to Houston in 1980, and one of the things that I always do when people come in to visit is take them to the Wall of Water. Um, and that is just, uh, if any of you haven't seen it, if you have some time, you should drive out to the Galleria. It's not very far from here. And spend a little time because it is so powerful not just to see from the road, but to get out and stand in the, the enclosure. Thank you, the enclosure, <laughs> and have this water surrounding you. And now people have weddings out there, and they have family reunions out there, and they have picnics out there, and it's just, it's just spectacular. So thank you for everything you've done to make our lives in Houston better. Um, anybody have questions for Mr. Hines? Yes, Council Member. Yes. The way we, we sometimes create architectural competitions, um, and we invite three, four, try to keep it down to three or four, but we did one in Milwaukee recently with Nor Northwestern Mutual, and uh, it was amazing the, the quality of the presentations, and, and then with Northwestern Mutual, they selected a particular, John Picard, because he had done the most, he had done the most homework on it. And uh, so he beat out SOM, 
and Caesar Pelli, and these are, but um, we've used that where we will give a, a certain amount to each architect to come up with a design, and then we look at, we have our conceptual construction group, which estimates the cost of each project and how we could change it and make it be sure it's economic, and um, uh, that group is, we work on projects all over the world, so it tells us which way to go and and uh, what that what the cost differences are going to be, and then we make a selection, uh, not just purely on architecture. It's the use, how it's going to intersect with the city, and with the the company, and those are fun fun projects. In the back, Mike. If it's a project, we'll get there. <laughs> We've got some of our guys looking at that from Phil from uh, Washington, D.C. now. All right, good. Uh, our scenic Pittsburgh is only three years old, so we don't have the high power, uh, particularly the ladies who seem to be here in Texas, that are so admirable. But I have a question for you that seems to fit into our needs in Pittsburgh that I've seen you done, and that is water. Your use of water, would you comment on that? Well, if you're talking about our, the big water feature at uh, Waterwall, uh, that's all recirculated water, and of course we get, we get substantial evaporation, but water is, intriguing to most people. If you can get a water feature of running or active like water wall, I mean, the way that is shaped, the way the sound of the water emanates from that, it's, it's exciting and intoxicating. And so, you know, I think of different water features, thinking of them in London, the way they did their, uh, that water feature in the, in the major park there. Um, I'm not sure that how successful that is, but people love to hear water. And if you can in some way evol evolve it, you will draw people to it. How big? I mean, uh, a, a small mining town of ten thousand people. A mining town. <laughs> We're becoming an oil capital. Uh, we have oil. Yeah, I know you got oil out there now. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, thank you very much. Abby. This is for where, Detroit? Detroit, she's scenic Michigan. We know a little about Detroit. We were, we were I don't know whether, was, I think we're still operating the city hall there. Uh, <laughs> and, and we re reduced, I know that we reduced the operating cost 60%. Wow. And, uh, but uh, Detroit's got, um, <clears throat> we've developed up there, of course we developed the new General Motors building and another major building there. Uh, 
uh, I think yours is a financial problem. How, <laughs> where can you get the money to spend to put those kind of features in your downtown? And uh, um, I think you need some very good financial planners to help you there to get the money to do it. I mean, uh, I, I'm not familiar with all the details of, of uh, the, financial, the finances of Detroit, but I know they have some challenges. <laughs> Jonathan? Jerry, thanks for coming. I wonder if you could comment on the regulatory environment within Frank's Bay Information Solutions world. In, in what? The regulatory environment in terms of land use as well as building codes. And what, what makes a city uh, regulatory system, uh, what, what makes it good for a development community in terms of We've operated in some pretty tough regulatory areas. We got beat up really badly in Aspen, and uh, but we had very good cooperation in Barcelona and and Paris, um, and in Milan. I mean, I think the city. If you can get the mayor behind you, and you've got a very energetic mayor, boy, he can make a lot of things happen. And <clears throat> we had a great, <clears throat> we had a great mayor in Barcelona, and we had a great mayor in in Paris, and in um, this is a suburb of Paris, and in Milan. So. I got, I got no throat. <laughs> CC. You started something miraculous with the gallery and it's gone up to the involved in the uptown district. Um, and the tax increment zone has, because of the numbers that Dahlia showed us, has really thrown off a lot of money. Would you comment just a little bit about what some of that funding is going to do, especially being mindful Sure. Well, as you can see, a lot of that will reconstruct streets within the uptown area, a lot of the TERS funds, and we have reconstructed many streets and built new streets like Guilford and Ambassador Way. We were, um, we reconstructed San Felipe from Yorktown all the way to, um, to the West Loop. And in the future, we are looking to build this um, beautiful Grand Boulevard, which is, is a mobility project which will bring people in from out in the suburbs to uptown that have no alternate means of transportation or other options into the area. Along with that, with the values going up, we are also able to, um, to move those funds over to Memorial Park and over the next 10 to 20 years, put in over $100 million to restore Memorial Park back to its, norm, its, its uh, former beauty and with the drought and with the hurricane and with, with pine beetle, pine bark beetles that have just devastated the park, um, we will, over the course of years, be able to bring it back to its natural beauty. It's a lot to accomplish yeah. from one vision. I mean, it's amazing yeah. what's going on in the city because of what Mr. Hyde started in Uptown Houston. Absolutely. And, and I think Uptown Houston was the first TERS ever created, is that right, in Houston? When well, up to number one? No, actually, the, um, the uh, improvement district was number one. Number We're one, so. 16 TERS. And how many are there now? Oh, there are well over 25, 30 districts. Yeah, so I just mentioned that mainly for the people from out of town because when you see streetscapes that are beautiful compared to those that aren't, you might be in one of these management district TERS areas. There's one at Uptown, there's one at Downtown, there's one at Midtown, there's one at Greenspoint, there's one at Greenway Plaza. I think there's 
one in Kirby, uh, and the Kirby Upper and Kirby, yes. and the Woodlands, and it's just it's 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 massive, and they actually have agreed to tax themselves. Essentially, it's not called a tax, but essentially tax themselves, mm -hmm. the people, the the property owners, and it creates it's created this value. So, um, you know, this is this is not government imposed. This is private property making property property private property owners making the decision if these improvements matter to their developments. How? Well, the ten, the ten, the ten-story height certainly limits your financial capacity, and then what you can pay for the land, and but you know that's what Washington D.C. decided to do, and we all live with it, and you do the best you can within those those confines, and I think the the open spaces and that our project created there in city center I think are going to be really important to the downtown life of Washington DC and uh, the fact you can walk to work almost any place in downtown DC is uh, we, we've, we've had very good luck on our condominiums our rentals are going a little slower than we thought okay anybody else Ron and then Mary There isn't an additional tax to owners in a tax increment reinvestment zone. What we do is, and this is a very easy way of explaining, so um, forgive me for that, but what we do is the, the city of Houston froze the tax base in 1999, and all the incremental value, all the incremental growth and the revenue from that growth is what comes back to the um, to Uptown for us to, to build or create specific projects that are part of the um, CIP, the city's project plan. And those projects for us are, are mobility projects. Um, this TERS was created specifically to address the needs of the mobility in the uptown area. And it is rebuilding San Felipe and rebuilding all the other streets and creating a secondary network and creating a pedestrian network. And as the values um, continue to increase um, in the uptown area, the revenue to do these projects also increases. Did I answer your question, maybe? Can you give us just some numbers of what, what you're seeing in terms of the linear footage? Um, well, I wish I could. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I, if there's someone that can help out with that, I'm, I, you know, we're, we are, um, this project that we are embarking on for Host Oak Boulevard, it is um, at a $200 million project to rebuild, reconstruct Post Oak Boulevard, to widen the street, to put dedicated bus lanes down the center of the street, and, um, and then to create this, this total environment in the uptown area. I apologize, I don't have specific numbers that I can help you out with that. Okay, one or two more quick questions, Mary.
Okay. <laughs> That's well, easy. <laughs> yeah, and actually the Harris County Improvement District is actually a taxing district. Um, our board of directors, uh, they all got together and agreed to tax themselves so that we could create an organization that can actually go out and take care of situations that might include an advertisement where we don't have to do that. We could have a budget to go out and clean up the streets and keep them beautiful, to keep your front yard looking beautiful and manicured and, and picking up bandit signs and doing all those little things that really do make a difference. So um, this, this, this tax allows us to be able to do those types of things and then promote the area in a, in a way that is a scenic and beautiful place to be. Yeah, the politics of getting that together and doing it was a big step in Butte. Yeah. And we're getting the property owners, but I think we had a, a really knowledgeable, informed group of property owners. Well, and the important thing to remember is that um, to maintain the value of property and to increase the value of that property was one of the most important things. And um, so it was our charge to make sure that we could do that, that we could keep this place a viable, economically sound place. And in order to do that, you know, creating a tax on those properties um, to, to aid us in doing those, yeah, those I things. Think, I think the way to help you would be to look at the values that have been created in the land because that is a selfish, if you're a landowner and you are increasing the value of your land, I mean, you look at the history of Houston in that area, you've got one hell of a selling point. Yeah. Excellent. And then they all Excellent. come together yeah. and they're all coming together to create this, this value for the, the entire area and not just individual properties. Gerard, one last question, Gerard Kinney. Well, in the, the tax increment mirror investment zone, it is the city of Houston um, HI, and HISD. School district. Right. I'm sorry, the school district. Yeah. So the school district has the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. We had that problem in last year. Has or has not? Has. The school district has is participating in their TERS. I don't know if that's yes. the case with every TERS in Houston I, or I not. I believe every, every um, organization is different and created yeah. for different needs. So okay. No, I believe they do, and that's financing is kind of getting out of my range, but yes. And we can talk after if you would like. Yeah. The city and the school district are the only two taxing entities that have agreed to the zone, to participate in the zone. So they give the, they froze the values, right. okay, mm -hmm. for purposes of taxation. Carol, this is the last one.
Thank you, Carol. Um, okay, I think that pretty much wraps it up. What a great, thank you.